Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this um, <clears throat> conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about the emergent, emergent uh, collective dynamics in agent, large agent systems. So it's so large, so it's not fitting <laughs> a screen. So, uh, <clears throat> so my, uh, my main field is artificial life. And it uh, was studied in 1987 when uh, in Santa Fe, I was in Santa Fe too uh, in 1989. But then there's a tons of interesting concepts and ideas. And then still, um, after 30 years, we are still you know, uh, working in this field. And then aim of, the aim of this uh, artificial life field is to answer the question, what is life, by exploring uh, emergent dynamics and open-ended evolution. So this talk, I'm, um, I'm going to uh, update what's the recent uh, a development in artificial life on how I'm, 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 how the artificial life is committing to uh, to uh, to biological life. I hope. So, so this is my uh, um, kind of drawing when I gave a keynote at artificial life conference in 2008. So, artificial life is all about theory of evolution and brain. And back in 1950 to uh, to 60, there is there, a cybernetics. It's about uh, uh, autonomous robot and then a philosophy and Alan Turing's uh, chemical reactions and then also von Neumann's uh, cell automata. These are the um, <clears throat> uh, classic artificial life studies and then from that we, we have been developing all these um, interesting ideas and artificial life started back in, uh, as, as I said, it's 1990. There's a bunch of interesting ideas that came out and then using that one we try to understand what is life, and then what the evolution is. So this year, uh, 2018, um, I'm organizing this artificial life conference in Tokyo, and then, uh, so this is a, a homepage, and then theme is uh, beyond AI. So there are a bunch of people who are interested in uh, how to use AI, but I'm sure that the era of AI popularity is gonna be end within five years, and then after AI paradigm, we have to think about new epistemology of artificial life and complex systems. So my kind of principle is life must come first and then artificial intelligence is just a side effect of artificial life. So artificial life is gonna be the main theme within five years, I, I hope. Then, <clears throat> as you know, uh, one of the big challenges for artificial life is how to use uh, new technologies, which we call uh, exponential technologies. So the computer is getting faster and faster. That's the main engine why we can use the deep learning and then we can use uh, massive data flows. Um, <clears throat> so using exponential technology, uh, the old ideas, uh, artificial life models back in 1970 and 1980 can be updated. For example, like um, uh, the game of life, um, random Boolean network, and also the uh, Craig Reynolds' void model is also can be updated with that exponential technologies. Um, so for the first, my talk is about uh, void model, but void model not in, a, um, <clears throat> in my computer, but with a, a K computer and then also a GP, GPU. Uh, the void model, I, you may know, uh, everybody been talking uh, the void model which is uh, 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 separation, alignment, and cohesion. There are a bunch of ways to uh, write down into the equations, but I, I, I didn't check carefully, but this one is, is more or less like a generic uh, form of uh, uh, Reynolds model. So um, simply using this one that I can uh, So this is uh, the famous uh, Boyd model with uh, 256 uh, individuals. And you can see th there's a sort of self-organization of uh, structures and patterns is evolving from uh, random, con uh, random conditions. Um, even though this is um, uh, quite a simple toy model, but it took a lot of co uh, computer power when back in 19, uh, 1990. But now we have a um, a strong computer, so I was hoping that we can uh, uh, compute more complex ones. So in order to uh, simulate a large-scale uh, void model, 
we need a GPGPU and then also a K computer. The K computer is a, like a supercomputer in, in Japan. Um, but still, it's compatible with the GPGPU because the K computer is even faster that many people want to use it at the same time, so it becomes slower and slower. Um, so, so this is the, uh, the <coughs> periodic boundary condition in a three-dimensional space. Uh, then the numbers of the individual is 2048. And so there's a big um, flock is going from here to here. So going from the left to right, that's what, uh, that's what you can see here, right? So because then it's a next scale is a 16, 3, 8, 4, uh, 2 to the 11th. Then there's different kind of structure emerges, like uh, this one, which is connected by this uh, small uh, snake-like uh, structures. And next scale is uh, 130,000. So apparently, oh, by the way, so density is the same, right? The, the space is getting bigger and bigger when we increase the numbers of the individuals. But the density per uh, space is also, it's always kept constant. And then you can see some um, interesting structures uh, in there. Then we can even um, scale up to uh, next level. Uh, sorry. So this is uh, uh, half million uh, numbers of the birds. Uh, it's not bird, but <laughs> it's individuals of making flocking behavior. So this structure is something interesting. That well, when I gave a di when I gave this talk, uh, the biologist studying uh, uh, birds flocking behavior uh, raised his hand and he said, "This is not birds." But I, I knew that. But, uh, so this is some, something like abstract flocking behavior that you can simulate with a, a bunch of um, <clears throat> birds. And then, um, yep. So the one, one of the big questions with this uh, system is how to... Um, uh, identify each flocking behaviors. So usually the people assume there's a, a one simple uh, flock, flocking behavior, but actually what happens is there are many, many of them. So uh, I use like uh, uh, k-means, it's uh, one of the simplest uh, clustering method, or uh, self-organizing map, or DB scan, or even deep neural network to classify uh, what is flock and then how many uh, flocking behavior, uh, flocking patterns that you can find in in this uh, <clears throat> space. That's what I was um, working with. Then, uh, one of the, <clears throat> the, yeah, one of the methods that I was uh, uh, using is not uh, three-dimensional real-time, real space, but we have to use a four-dimensional metric space. So, x, y, z plus uh, the amplitude of, um, sorry, <laughs> it's my Gmail. Uh, amplitude of the the speed is also big, uh, the important uh, dimension. So this is the, the one that you see. So when you see this, for human observers, it's apparent that there is a flocking behavior, which is connected by the snake-like patterns. But you know, if you want to use machine learning to classify them, it's, usually it's difficult. And then if you are scaling up, there are a bunch of uh, interesting uh, behaviors happening. Now, I, I, as you, I will, show you that within this uh, flocking behavior, there's a Brownian or a singular uh, levy flight-like behavior you can find in here. But outside of this one, there's a, a more coherent uh, dynamics that you can observe. Yeah. And then, um, sorry. Yeah, going back to the... So, <clears throat> by using the, some techniques that we can uh, temporarily uh, follow how the flocking behavior changes over time. So you can see some of those uh, flocking behavior, like uh, blue ones and all these kind of things, it's changing its patterns. But these are very slow dynamics that 
is there, it's slowly changing its, its structures. But for these uh, snake-like patterns, they have less uh, lifetime so that they can uh, vanish. But they, they are very interesting uh, roles to uh, connect from one big one to the other big ones. So <clears throat> for one of the techniques that we can use is a uh, um, non-negative matrix factorization. So taking, uh, so usually the people use it as a documents and terms, but uh, for this uh, void model, I use, uh, this one is a time axis, and this is the ID number of the, of the individuals. So we can uh, factorize into uh, uh, some sort of, of, of mode. Maybe these, these are corresponding to the flock, and then this is the IDs of the, uh, of the void. So this is a one way to classify whether there exists um, uh, flocking behavior in terms of, of NMF. And you can see uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is time from 1,500 time steps to 250 time steps. There's some, some uh, waves is coming up. And these waves is corresponding to these patterns. And this one is a uh, kind of mode. Uh, so there's one. So you can see some, some of the mode. So even if you have a big block, and there's a bunch of different mode is coupling with each other and then evolving in time. Then I will look into the speed. Uh, so this is a velocity, and this is a fluctuation of the velocity, and this is a density, local density, and then also this is a local density fluctuations. So <clears throat> if you look at the size, and uh, then um, the bigger, uh, the larger size uh, swarms has a slower, slower time scale, uh, slower speed, and then but density goes up. So <clears throat> and then also the fluctuation has the same thing. Uh, Small to a middle size flock of flocks has a larger fluctuations, but for for the larger uh, larger flocks has a large uh, local density fluctuations. So the big one has a slow speed, and then fluctuations goes up of the density. But the middle size and then also small ones has much faster than the big ones. But the fluctuations, a uh, local density fluctuation, is very suppressed. And I, as I said, there's an anomalous diffusion that's going on in the large flocks. So <clears throat> uh, in, su in some, that what happens is that there's a two different kinds of fluctuations that exist. This is the flock size, and this is the susceptibility. Right? So when you see, uh, so if the flock size is going from uh, uh, the scale of 10 to the second to the 10 to the fifth. And the bigger ones has uh, fluctuations over uh, density fluctuations. but the smaller ones, less than 10,000, uh, 1,000, is about uh, velocity fluctuations. So the different susceptibility to the different uh, external uh, uh, perturbation can be expected from here. So that's what I thought was quite interesting, because uh, <clears throat> when you are uh, scaling up, up to larger than 10 to the fourth, then you can find a different kind of structures, which is characterized by these uh, uh, different kinds of fluctuations. That's what I thought was interesting with these uh, large systems. And also, uh, people might say, well, because this one is a very abstract model, but I have been working with this uh, uh, oil droplet, with, which is um, uh, oleic anhydride with uh, water. Then this is my uh, very the first experiment I did in 2007. Um, so you can see a bunch of uh, droplet is generated and then coupling with each other and moving around. So this is more like uh, chemical uh, gliders. The, the game of life is very uh, fragile, but this one is much more uh, you know, robust because this one is happening in the real space. So the one that I saw in this, uh, uh, the void model can be applicable to this kind of uh, <clears throat> artificial chemical droplet. Yeah. Then um, <clears throat> I was thinking that maybe so the, the one that we've, we have found can be applicable to the honeybee stuff. Um, so I was, uh, fortunately, I've been working with uh, uh, Gene Robinson in the University of Illinois. Uh, then uh, we have uh, um, analyzed how the honeybee hive is going to show any kinds of corrective behavior or not. So uh, we have uh, five different uh, um, uh, honey, honey, uh, honeybee hive, and then each bee has a QR code on, on its back. So we can trace each individual uh, 
um, for, for a longer period of time, then we can see what sort of individuality can commit to the, uh, the collective behaviors. Now I can uh, tell you one of those uh, discoveries that I've found. So first of all, so this is a, um, this is a video that, uh, that we can generate from the data. So this is where the heading of the each bee. Um, and the, the data is like this one. Right? So this is time. And this is the positions in two-dimensional space. And this is the heading directions. And these are the B ID, ID, ID number. So when uh, there's a, the, the line is connecting to one individual to the others, means that the bees are interacting with each other face to face. I don't know whether you can notice. There's, sometimes there's a bunch of, you know, like a, this, this collective, uh, you know, uh, activity is going on. And then it's calmed down, but it's, it's coming up. Like it's, there's a, some collective um, um, bursting behavior that can be generated within the system. So now it's, it's, it's a bursting, right? But now it's, it's, it's going to suppress. Again, it's going to be... Uh, happening again, right? So in order to analyze this one, um, we look into this uh, time series. And this is the uh, uh, kinetic energy. So we can define the kinetic energy for each individual Vs, like uh, for each unit of time, how, how much distance the, the each V can uh, move around. So the, this is the definition of kinetic energy. So we can define uh, total uh, kinetic energy of the nest. So the nest, so this global kinetic energy is bursting over time, and here this this door was open. So first of all, the the honeybee hive was in a closed set, but then the door was open, so honeybee can go up, go outside, and then can come back. So the question is, how this bursting behavior changes when we open the door, and then uh, before and after the door opening event. Then we noticed that there is an interesting uh, two uh, different uh, characteristic of bursting behavior. One is an endogenous burst, which might be caused by the interaction between bees. And there's an ex exogenous burst, which is caused by externally. There's kind of stimulus is coming from outside. That's why the bee becomes, so, becomes activated. And then you know, there's big bursts coming out. So. <clears throat> I looked into this, uh, so this is time, and this is the, how the, the kinetic burst, uh, global kinetic burst is going up. And you can see, um, this, is for the, this is for the endogenous, and this is for the exogenous. So endogenous starts very slowly, but exogenous happens rapidly. So I try to understand what causes by this kind of thing. So because we have a um, QR code for every uh, B, so we, as you see here, right, uh, so this is the global uh, kinetic energy. So before this global uh, bursting happens, there's, first of all, this B574 is activated, and then another one is also activated. But this one is a queen bee, so it's always, it's always activating, but uh, this B, B574 or B31 is, is only happens, I mean, at a certain period of time. So this, in this case, 574 and B31 um, started to um, the bursting, then the other one is also start to burst. So we try to, again, we are using like um, uh, NMF, uh, negative matrix uh, factorization, and see what sort of mode is, is we can see here. So for, for this N exogenous burst, there is a, uh, only one or two, uh, I mean, it's a maximum. Almost all the bees are co contributing to this uh, bursting behavior. But for the endogenous ones, there is a sequential uh, activation of, of, um, of bursting behaviors. First of all, some bees become activated, and then that, those bees can going to activate some other bees, then other bees are going to activate. So there is a cascading process that is going on here. But for the external uh, exogenous burst, there is no such cascading bursting behaviors. It's more like uh, everyone, is, everyone is, is going to activate at the same time. So we are using, um, um, this is um, um, multi-dimensional scale. 
So which one causes the birth? You can see, so this is a different nest. This is 1201 and 1301 in the uh, different conditions with the different uh, numbers of the bees. But still, the red one happens before a door opening, then blue one happens after the, uh, the door opens. So before the door opens, only the bees are, in a, bees are only in a closed room. But after the door has been opened, the bees can go out and come in. So there's the information cascade is expected after the door has been opened. And then also, it's interestingly, it, uh, the individual bees that caused the burst is different before and after the door opening. So maybe some of the bees can carry the information and then causing an information cascade when the burst has been observed. So we try to do uh, um, whether the foragers can be a pioneer bees. So when I say pioneer bees, it's bees that can cause bursting behaviors. And as you see here, um, once you open the door, there are a bunch of bees which go out to forager, to, to become forager, is also committing to the birth. So it may be true that the foragers can be the pioneer bees, that pioneer bees can cause uh, bursting behaviors. So there should be some sort of information cascade is going on when uh, when you see these uh, corrective behaviors. And then finally, uh, one of the things that I want to discuss is uh, the web services. So uh, the first of all was a void model that we can see some uh, collective behaviors of the, the big flocks and then was connected through this uh, uh, coherent behaviors. But there's a two different uh, fluctuations that we can observe. And then uh, a honey beehive, there's also uh, different kind of clusters which maybe uh, information is uh, carried out from the uh, foragers to cause bursting behavior. And then this, those bursting behavior is um, a characteristic of information cascade within a honey beehive. And the web service is uh, interesting because it's one of the most complex artif artificial uh, systems that we, the human being has been created. And then we are, uh, there's one of the services called Room Clip so we are using room clip uh, data to, uh, to, an to analyze what kind of evolutionary processes is going on within uh, web services. So this web services is uh, it's a tagging data, right? So the each, each user can uh, post a photo with, with some, from, some tags associated with the photo, right? So we have each uh, user's ID and then also uh, what kind of fo photo or what kind of tag has been um, submitted to the, to the system. And then uh, the system size is, is about uh, 10 to the, 10 to the, so it's almost 10,000 to 100,000 users has been um, uh, involved in these web services. So what is the interesting here is that, so we are using uh, like uh, hoax processes. Hoax processes is like uh, 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 Poisson processes. So this one is a Poisson processes without the second term. But with the second term, it's more like a feedback from the other uh, users. So once some user posts uh, the photo, then other user posts uh, other uh, contribution to the web services. If there's some interactions, if someone posts, then the other one won't also wants to post again and again. So there's a feedback from the other users. That is, is uh, represented by the second term. So if you uh, take into account this term, then the interesting point is that, um, so we are, um, so, so, so the integral kernel is, um, is an exponential term. And once uh, exponential uh, term is, is it goes to one, then it's, it's going to be uh, critical. So what I'm saying here is that if you can take an uh, integral uh, kernel as a, a times exponential to the minus p, then this A over B is a, is, a, is a nice index that you can see how the system is evolving towards what. So what you can see here is that the exponent in A over B is, is going to close to one as time goes by. So this is time, and this is the exponent. So exponent is starting from here and then uh, going towards one, but not exactly one, right? So what we can see is that uh, the exponent is 
somehow distributed around one means that the system is going to the critical state. So it's, well, you can say this one is like a, a self-organized uh, criticality, but uh, it's not on the critical point. It's a little bit uh, before the, the critical point that uh, the web services is con uh, diverging into this point, uh, concentrated in this, on this point. And more interestingly, uh, we are looking at uh, what kind of users is, is, is committing to, to these web services. So uh, we are looking at the active users and then using a cluster, uh, clustering an, uh, algorithm to, uh, to simulate, what, uh, to, to characterize what kind of uh, users that you can see here. And then uh, the distance between users is uh, measured by the uh, Jensen-Shannon uh, divergence, which is if, it, if the two users are using the same, word, same keywords, same tags, then we say these users are close to each other, right? So at one threshold, we see uh, three different uh, uh, communities. Three different communities is, uh, is spontaneously emerging from these web services. And these three uh, different uh, uh, clusters is corresponding to, the, they are the same users. This red one and blue one and the yellow one, they are consist of uh, rather similar uh, users. They have similar profiles. They, are, they have been using similar uh, keywords. That's, I thought, was interesting. And then more interestingly, when we are looking into uh, who is generating a Nobel, Nobel keywords, right? So room creep users can generate, some, sometimes put new keywords, but sometimes just reusing the already existing keywords. So this one, the nobility is coming from uh, uh, same users. That's I thought was interesting. That uh, we, we're not going into the details, but if uh, the same users is 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 uh, collecting to each other, then those clusters with the uh, uh, same profile uh, users tend to generate more Nobel, Nobel keywords rather than heterogeneous communities. So I can say that. Um, uh, novelty or creativity is coming from, not from a heterogeneous community, but it's a homogeneous uh, community is, has a more potential to create new keywords. So uh, my discussion is that, uh, so studying this uh, large system, also the evolutionary system, that you can uh, discuss that, well, you can develop uh, super organisms, but you really have to increase uh, the numbers of the size up to say 10 to the fourth. So 10,000 is probably the low, uh, the first uh, maximum, uh, first uh, critical size of the system that can create uh, a super organisms. In, in our cases, different kind of fluctuation emerges after 10 to the fourth. So what we can expect is after this one, it's probably one billion numbers of those sizes, there's a new kind of uh, superorganism can emerge. So, like in uh, physical systems, probably there's a, a orders of the scale, uh, scale orders that where the superorganisms can emerge or not is determined by, uh, by this number. But uh, this is my hypothesis, but uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. The second thing is, uh, nobility is coming from homogeneous groups and then also isolated groups, and they can make uh, nobilities. So usually the people think that community must have heterogeneity to have a interesting, uh, diverse cultures and a new uh, <clears throat> culture to come up. But actually what happens is that homogeneous groups can create more nobility comparing with uh, heterogeneous groups. And the third thing uh, I didn't have time to, to uh, introduce here, but the robustness is uh, also possible when you have a, a huge number of, uh, of, of, of individuals. So what I did was uh, one is a uh, uh, Peter Gatchis model. So this cell automata has a, has a two, to the 20, two, 2 to the 223 states per each site. So it's more like a cell automata with a, each site has a big computer. A big computer is connected to each other. So if you have this system, that you can self-simulating what happens in your own system. So using self-simulation that you can be uh, much robust than the one to the, to the noise. This is also the von Neumann's idea that uh, von Neumann's dream that how, how you can make a self-reproduction which is uh, robust against noise. And then what is required here is not just a two state or three states, but two to the 223 state is necessary per site 
to have a, a robust server automata. That's uh, we can expect, and we. 70% um, we have done with these simulations of the, of the Peter Gatch's model. But uh, maybe next time that I can uh, show you. And finally, um, my, my final quote is that this is a paper from uh, uh, Rodney Brooks, which I also invited him to the, to the Artificial Life Conference this year. And he, uh, in 2001 Nature paper, that he says, why his robot, or why artificial life never becomes life? Right? That's a huge problem for artificial life people, right? Why the Roomba is still a robot and not, uh, you know, the living systems? And then uh, he discusses within, within his paper that uh, maybe uh, the first one is uh, uh, few, we might be just getting a few parameters wrong, right? Or maybe we might be building, building models that are below some complexity threshold, or maybe Perhaps it is still a lack of computing power, right? And then I, I thought maybe we have to go to number two and three. That's why I'm always making a complex models. And then also because we are now having a, a big computing power, so two and three might be solved, right? And I hope my selection of parameters is right. But always, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> people want to understand What's, uh, what's missing? I can be missing some fundamental, uh, fundamental and currently unimagined uh, laws that may exist in the world, and that's what um, I still, you know, dream sometimes. Maybe uh, not you know, probabilistic or not deterministic, but should it be in deterministic model should uh, should it be applied to understand what is life, to answer what is life, and that's the future of artificial life studies. Thank you very much. <laughs>